Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Fortman. I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor, and I'm joined, as usual, by my colleague. Hi, I'm Kim Smith. I'm the Deputy Commissioner. And uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, briefing on uh, unemployment insurance, and we hope to be able to provide a kind of a top line a overview of some uh, new information that we have, a uh, new program that we'll be rolling out, as well as an update on the basic information that we provide to you on, a, on an ongoing basis about claim levels. Um, I want to welcome the legislators who are joining us, and uh, legislators, of course, can either ask a question um, by unmuting themselves or by putting something into the chat box. Uh, we also know that other people are joining by Facebook, uh, and um, there, I guess we've identified the fact that there may be some confusion, that folks on Facebook may be trying to ask us questions as this is happening, and we do not see those questions until after the briefing. But if people have questions that they want to put in there, we will review those and we can uh, fold those into our briefing next week if there are topics that we're not covering. We're hoping that the, um, that the presentation that we'll do, the briefing that we do this afternoon, will touch on most of the questions that people do have. So, so I think with that, let's uh, dive into the slides. The um, first slide up here is some new guidance that we received last night from the U.S. Department of Labor about the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. This guidance is directed toward um, individuals who are eligible for PUA but self-certifies that they are unemployed, partially unemployed, or unable or unavailable to work because a child or other person in the household um, for which the individual has primary caregiver and responsibility is unable to attend school or another facility, and we've emphasized that is closed as a direct result of the COVID-19 public health emergency. So if you remember back in the spring when um, PUA was first rolled out, pandemic unemployment assistance, there were some specific uh, questions in there around caregiving responsibilities and what would or would not make uh, someone eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance. And at that time, it was clear that the person would not be eligible if they had the ability to telework with pay or if they were receiving sick leave or other paid benefits. That piece of it has not changed. Um, what and this is not necessarily a change, but there is some added clarification that's being provided about what does it mean to say that a school or other child care facility is closed. We do know that schools are taking a variety of approaches in, um, in the fall, and uh, this guidance uh, has several scenarios in it that um, begin to provide clarity about what is covered and is not covered. We haven't had a chance to thoroughly review it yet. Um, we will be carefully reviewing it, but we have posted um, the USDOL guidance on our website, so you can look at the actual USDOL guidance, and we will be posting some additional um, Q&A uh, information uh, on this early next week. So I think that's the one new thing that has happened. Um, the other, and I guess this is new too, um, <clears throat> is we told you last week that we were applying for the Lost Wages Assistance Program. That is the funding um, being provided through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It temporarily adds um, $300 uh, in benefits to people who are eligible for either state unemployment or um, one of the federal programs if they are directly impacted by COVID-19. We applied last week. We uh, were approved, I want to say Tuesday night, um, <clears throat> and we are in the process 
of uh, getting that program up and running. Uh, again, as a reminder, this is not an unemployment insurance program. It is a grant through FEMA uh, out of the federal um, relief, disaster relief fund, and it is capped uh, nationally at $44 billion in funding. And we have been approved for three weeks of funding at this point. All states that applied for funding um, were approved uh, and were all approved for three weeks of initial funding. And then after that, we need to apply on a, um, a weekly basis to receive additional funds. And again, that funding is capped at $44 billion. And there's a, a rough estimate out there of uh, these funds will last approximately five to seven weeks. We, we don't really know. It depends on how quickly that we hit that $44 billion cap or until um, the funds in the federal disaster relief program um, get, uh, are reduced to $25 billion because of other emergencies. Again, the $44 billion is in one bucket. The other funds that uh, would be drawn down by uh, disasters is a different bucket, and I'm not sure how much money is in there, but when that one, if that one got to $25 billion, that they would stop the $44 billion program over here and then redirect those funds toward their um, core mission. But uh, at this point, we have received um, the allocation so that when we do get the, uh, the program uh, components in place, we will begin to um, make those payments. Anything, Kim, on that that I've missed? No. Nope. If we move to the next slide, talk a little bit about who is eligible for the uh, lost wages assistance. They, the benefits will be paid to anyone who is eligible for one of the other unemployment programs, as the commissioner said. The minimum weekly benefit that someone is eligible for must be at least $100. And this is um, the, the weekly benefit amount that someone would see on their monetary determination. So this is not affected by, uh, for instance, someone who's working part-time and, and has a reduced benefit for the week because of hours that they work. It would be the weekly benefit that's on their monetary determination plus any dependency allowances. So someone could be receiving an extra $10 a week um, in support of their dependents. So that would also be factored in. Um, and then the other criteria is that the individual must be unemployed or partially unemployed as a direct result of COVID-19. Um, once we implement, as the commissioner said, we will be paying these retroactively. We have been approved for funding for the weeks ending August 1st, August 8th, and August 15th so far. Uh, we will be making these payments automatically once we have the system up and running. There isn't anything that anyone needs to do in order to receive those benefits. Um, and those, those three weeks that were funded for already, um, plus an additional week if, if we uh, subsequently get funded for more, that will all be paid in a lump sum once we're ready to roll out. Exactly. And, and as, uh, as the Deputy Commissioner said, you do not need to reapply. These are retroactive and will be based on information that has already been provided Correct. for the weeks of August 1st, August 8th, and August um, 15th. The other um, program that we wanted to touch on that we did mention last week as well is the State Extended Benefit Program. And so this is a state um, unemployment benefit of an additional 13 weeks for people who have exhausted their 13 weeks of federal pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. Again, you do not need to reapply for these benefits. Um, they, uh, any, if you are eligible, you will automatically uh, see information on your weekly certification. And I think we have a slide mm -hmm. on that, yes. The weekly certification for PE pandemic um, emergency unemployment compensation and emergency um, and the extended benefit program will see the same, um, same certification. So when someone's benefit amount reaches zero on their next weekly certification, these are um, a few basic questions 
that uh, you will be asked, and um, after you answer those, you will be moved into uh, the appropriate program, whether it's PEUC or EB. Mm -hmm. It's just one time, so when it's right after your, your benefit balance reaches zero, just on the next weekly certification. These are the, the questions we are required to ask before we move somebody into the next program. And again, they're just um, the, the answers that are on there are not the ones that one would need to put on there. Those are just illustrative. Yeah, and if they, are, I don't know if everybody on, on can see, so it's are you receiving unemployment compensation under the laws of Canada? Have you worked in another state or are you receiving or are you eligible for regular or extended unemployment compensation from any other state or under the federal um, unemployment? Quite a long question. Um, and then the final question is, are you a U.S. citizen and if not, um, to provide your um, information there. Okay, the other question that we're being asked are, um, is about work search activities. Um, we've been talking about this for several weeks now, I think since the beginning of August. Um, and again, if someone is uh, not self-employed and not um, in regular contact with their employer, um, we would consider them permanently separated from, their, from employment and those folks must engage in some sort of work search activities each week in order to continue to be eligible for unemployment benefits. And um, although uh, typically uh, EB requires a uh, much more stringent work search uh, activity, during these pandemic unemployment times, all of the work search activities are going to uh, be more expansive and include uh, skill development as, a, as an acceptable work search activity. Um, we've tried to harmonize the programs as much as possible so there's uh, reduced confusion. So we do have um, some FAQs up on work search. Um, we do want to remind people that if you are required, um, if your constituents are required to participate in work search activities, that you're also required to be registered on the main job link. Um, we've been holding two interactive workshops a week. There is much more interest now in the, um, in the workshop, and so we've expanded that to three workshops a week on how to register and use the main job link. And I know earlier today we were having a conversation about, well, why would I go to a workshop to understand this? And it's because there are, um, if you're having challenges navigating uh, the, uh, the site, the workshop will help you do that. It will also um, allow you to tap into all of the features that are available there and to really maximize um, the benefits that are offered through Main Job Link. And the, the uh, link for registering is the maincareercenter.com. Um, forward slash employment, forward slash workshop, and you can get information there not only for the main job link workshop, but also other workshops that are available at the Career Center. Another program that we've been asked questions about is WorkShare, and uh, Kim, do you want to just walk us through the, the sure, WorkShare piece? Happy to. So WorkShare is a program that's intended to be a layoff aversion program. Uh, it is actually being used quite a bit recently as businesses are starting to reopen so that they can bring their, their workers back on a part-time basis. But there are some requirements around it. Uh, for instance, uh, it can't be related to a seasonal or intermittent downturn. Um, and one of the key things is that the hours that are worked must be within the range of 10 to 50 percent of what the individual would normally work. So the work share program requires that the, the shift or the unit that is impacted within the business be a full-time shift or unit, but not everybody has to work full-time. As long as the, the unit is operating on a full-time basis, you could have part-time workers in there. They must be working somewhere between 10 and 50 percent of their normal hours. Um, if, you, if the individuals fall outside of that range, for instance, if they were normally working 40 hours but for whatever reason only worked 10 to 15 in that week, it's no longer considered a work share claim and we would then have to reprocess that as a regular state unemployment claim. 
And I know lots of people have been confused about that. So the work reduction, you're either working 50% of your normal hours or up to 90% of your normal hours. Right. So that's the range that you must be um, operating in in order to be eligible. I think the other thing is that for someone to participate in work share, they need to meet the normal um, monetary, monetary eligibility, eligibility requirements. Uh, which is in over the course of the previous 18 months, we earned at least $1,700 in two different quarters and $5,600 um, overall within the, the calendar year. And we do know that this has been confusing um, for uh, employees as well as employers um, <clears throat> because you can have two people working uh, in the same unit um, and yet uh, perhaps I'm not monetarily eligible, and therefore I would not be eligible for work share. Um, and you know, Kim may be. So that's why we can see um, some differences in uh, how different employees in the same company, and it may not seem particularly consistent. Um, also, uh, employers must complete a spreadsheet on a weekly basis containing information, and employees must also fill out um, their regular weekly certifications. So there are lots of moving parts there. We think this is an excellent program for companies, for certain kinds of business models. It's not necessarily a good fit for every single employer. Um, but we are working closely with um, employers uh, to uh, streamline the process as much as possible and to uh, deal with any any uh, challenges that that are arising, particularly for employees. And we've met one on one um, with at least one employer to try to um, deal with some particular complexities about that that business and are happy to do that with others as well. Okay, so this is the, where we're going to shift into the more um, the numbers part of uh, the presentation. And we are all aware that even though we're talking about numbers, that these reflect real people in real lives and, um, and, and we never lose sight of that. Um, we are, although the top line number doesn't seem to have moved a lot, we're uh, roughly um, making determinations for 98% of initial claimants, and I think we hit that 90% mark about three weeks ago, mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um, the uh, benefit payment amount has consistently gone up. We're at about 89%. Uh, of people who are receiving their um, benefit payments, and 7% uh, of the folks are inactive because they're not filing weekly certifications, and about 2% are ineligible uh, for benefits. And since March 15th, about 135, almost 135 and a half um, thousand people have received at least one benefit payment, and um, we are laser focused on um, the 2% of claimants who have not received uh, their determination, and we're taking a number of steps to address that, including um, expediting our fact-finding process. We also are continuing to refine our fraud detection and our recovery processes. Uh, you know, you've, you've heard me say many times that um, in May, we were hit with a uh, high volume of fraudulent claims, uh, and uh, we have been doing everything humanly possible since then to both detect fraud before it goes out um, and uh, also pay all eligible claimants as quickly as possible while doing our due diligence on verifying uh, that, uh, that the claims are legitimate claims. So on, on this slide, I'm focusing on the, the bar chart and the, the furthest to the right, there's about 1,700 people that represent that 2% that the commissioner was just talking about. And I want to point out that that's down from 2,900 that we reported last week. 
And I also wanted to add that it's, it's not the, the same group of people that are in that category every week. So we have roughly 1,300 people. We've been averaging the last few weeks that are, are new filers coming into the system. So we dropped from 2,900 to 1,700, but really means we processed about 2,500 um, applications for people. And if you just think back, like our normal uh, caseload in the summer is, in a, is about like 350. Um, so even though those numbers are down dramatically from where they were in um, March and April, uh, they're still uh, significantly higher than a, a normal claims load would be for us. And of those 1,700 folks that I just mentioned, um, the pie chart on the right-hand side breaks down where they are in process, as you can see. The vast majority, just over 1,100 people, are waiting for fact-finding. We have um, 368 that have been denied state unemployment and are in the process of moving over to the PUA program. We have 88 people um, awaiting for, where we're waiting for some paperwork from the employer. We have a 10-day window after somebody applies where we send information out to the employer. If we don't hear back within the 10 days, we automatically move people into pay status. If we do hear back from the employer sooner, we will move them into pay status sooner. And then 176 people that are in pending status, and that means that on their initial application, um, we found that there was a mismatch with name. Um, for instance, when we send off to the Social Security Administration, or there was a mismatch in wages from what they reported on their initial claim to what we have in our system. And so those are issues that we have to resolve before we can um, process their claim any further. And then on the next slide, um, the 1,100 people that I mentioned that are waiting for a fact finding, the vast majority of those folks are from July and August. We have six people left over from May uh, still waiting and 62 people who filed an initial claim in June. So uh, we've been working on those fact findings from oldest to newest and are pleased to see that March and April are no longer on there and I fully expect that next week um, we'll be dealing with July and August claims only. And it's also important to point out that, um, you know, when somebody files an initial claim, they may have filed an initial claim uh, and then not filed right. in between and if they reopen. So April could pop back up there um, if if they open a claim later because that would be the the, the date that would be used. Um, but there are, are no people left in this fact-finding bucket who have been continuously waiting um, since since those times. Okay, we've received several questions about the Coursera. Um, the relationship that we have with Coursera, where, it, as we mentioned, um, we have partnered with them to provide 5,000 unemployed workers with access to roughly 3,800 courses. It's through their Workforce Recovery Initiative, the Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative. And the part that I want to stress is that this program is free for both the state to participate in as well as the learners. Uh, in order to be eligible, the learner must register by September 30th and complete their, their course uh, by the end of December. Um, so far, 750 people have signed up. Um, the Coursera classes are counted as part of the work search activity um, for eligibility for unemployment insurance. And the way that you would sign up is through the career centers. Um, we have staff at each of the career centers who can help um, explore what a good fit might be um, and um, get you signed up in this program. And again, the, that um, address is maincareercenter.gov. So, um, so far we've gotten pretty good feedback about this opportunity. We wanted to um, just spend a few minutes to talk a little bit about what we've been uh, working on over the summer. Um, you know, we've gone through these slides a couple of times. Uh, the Deputy Commissioner pointed out some of the progress that we had made, but I think it's important to just do a kind of a top line summary. Um, when we started doing these briefings back in the beginning of June, 
our initial um, determination rate was about 80% of people had received an initial determination um, when we began these conversations in June, and now that number is 98%. So we've made significant progress. Um, one of the ways we've been able to do that is by revamping our fact-finding uh, processing system. I'm also happy to say that we've decreased our phone wait time. Um, I, I hesitate to say it out loud, but there were times in the past two days that people were waiting for folks to call in um, as opposed to uh, the long wait times. Um, so significant progress has been made there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, once fraud hit, we had to put new systems in place for fraud detection as well as ID verification so that would, you know, legitimate um, main people could still access their benefits. Um, we've also spent the past um, six, eight weeks um, developing data tracking tools to improve services and monitor what's happening. And we're excited to say that we have a uh, website redesign that we're, we will be rolling out um, very, very soon. All of these initiatives and enhancements um, that we've been working on, I, I want to just acknowledge that we've uh, been working on with support from a leading consultancy group, McKenzie and Company. Um, so I want to thank them for their help. And to give you a little bit of a preview of the uh, website redesign, I know it's hard to see on the screen. So um, I don't know if Kim, you want to walk us through this a little bit, but our, our goal was to make it a little bit easier to find key pieces of information. Mm -hmm. And um, so, we, yeah, we've modified um, the, the, the menu items that you'll see on the left-hand side. I think, for instance, they used to say claimant and employer, or that's what they currently say. So we're making it more subject-related in that column, as well as um, putting a, a little more information on the page itself as to um, what do you need to do on the web page, as opposed to um, the, the list of information that we had before. So if you're new to unemployment, it says start here, for instance. If you've already applied, then these are the things that you need to do. Uh, we have a section there for our FAQs. Um, there's some videos that are up there, uh, and there are pieces that are uh, that will provide information that we have not had up there. For instance, under the have questions, you'll see uh, the first item there is what does my status mean? So we're trying to provide a little more information about what somebody sees when they're looking at their status in the reemployment system. And we've recently started getting questions about appeals, and so there's mm -hmm. a, a section that's kind of pulled out. Um, so that you can easily find that and go to that so that you don't, uh, hopefully it makes it um, easier to get the information that you are particularly interested in without having to weed through all, um, just scrolling through lots and lots of information. So uh, as we said, we're hoping that we're gonna get that out over the weekend, um, but okay. So the first question, what did you mean by under federal unemployment in that question about exhausted benefits? Um, so when we're asking, I believe that was the question of where we, uh, the new questions that we put in, if somebody's balance is zero, uh, mm -hmm. there was a series of three questions that we asked. So there are some federal unemployment programs. We have federal employees that are in the state, so you could be a former federal employee. You could be, like there are, uh, there's a railroad, um, Retiree program, not retiree, employee program. So that's what it's meant by those different programs. Can you share whether the Competitive Skills Scholarship Program is currently awarding scholarships? The recent report on the program stated that mm -hmm. it had been paused uh, until the, in the fall of 2019 until spring 2020. Yeah, and um it, where it's, it has not reopened uh, for accepting new um, new participants at this time. Um, and as soon as it is, we will have information up on the website. Again, it's a finite um, pool of money. Um, 
and um, as soon as more resources are available. Uh, the career centers are the place to access uh, information and connection to the program as well. So career centers are a, a great resource. So the next question is that there are a few constituents who have reported that their, their personal information was used fraudulently to open an account, and how can they confirm that their notification has been received? If they filled out the ID theft form that's on our website, they would get a confirmation um, mm -hmm. email. So that if they did not get that email, uh, I would suggest that they put it through again. Or contact. Certainly, they yeah. can call in to verify. But right. But if there is an automatic uh, email confirmation that goes out. How many fact findings are taking place on a weekly basis, and how far out are fact findings being scheduled? Um, I would have to, to look at the actual number on average that we're processing. But as far as scheduling out, um, we're using an expedited fact finding process, so we're not using the scheduler. We are mm -hmm. uh, conducting the fact findings based on um, oldest to, to newest and um, the categories for individuals that have been waiting the longest. And we're roughly handling somewhere between 110 and 130 fact findings a day. There's a rumor that certificates of completion, uh, there, there's a fee for Coursera. I have not heard that for Coursera. No. We'll, we'll double check that, but that is it, not accurate. There is an employer um, who has employees whose claims have been approved even though their claims were fraudulent and the employer has been notified by DOL, but there hasn't been any additional communication. How do we know that those claims are not being paid? Uh, if, if we have flagged a claim as fraudulent, we are definitely not paying on it. I do know that um, communications still get sent to employers um, and sometimes the individual as well. We are in the process of making sure that those mailings stop, but at this point we know that they are still going out there automated. <laughs> Will the new website allow constituents to self-reset their password without needing to contact the department? Um, no. Right. If it's like the three strikes and you're out. So if you've made two attempts to enter your password and you have failed twice to log in, I would suggest using the Reset My Password link. You do need to have your email verified in the system, uh, and that means going in and actually uh, clicking on the Verify My Email link. We will send a link to that email, and you need to follow the instructions in that email. So it is more than just going in and looking, and looking at it to make sure that the email that looks right in the system, you actually have to click on it. But that will allow you to reset your password and, and avoid you from being locked out. If you are, if you try it a third time and you get locked out, then you do need to call in. Fortunately, as, as the commissioner said, um, call volume uh, is down. And just this morning, we had a two-minute wait to speak with someone. So we have employers reporting that they're receiving notices that their experience ratings would be charged, uh, but haven't received con confirmation that they would not be charged. Um, what do they need to do to get that individualized confirmation? Um, certainly they can call the employer line and, and speak with one of the representatives there. Um, I would have to look into that one further, um, uh, because I, my understanding was the notices had been updated to reflect that they would not be charged, as long as it's COVID-related. Right. If there are some other circumstance where the employee is no longer working, not related to COVID, they are chargeable. Right. And we do have a number of cases where it's not COVID-related.
So following up on one of the earlier questions, um, claims were not flagged by us as fraudulent, but by the employer. I'm assuming that they notified us that these are fraudulent. Uh, and if that's the case, we have flagged them in our system as fraudulent and would not be paying on them. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, please, um, you know, pay attention to the, the website. Um, we're hoping that you'll be able to find any information that you need there. We will be putting more information about the federal guidance on that um, website as we update the FAQs and uh, also additional information on the lost wage assistance program as it becomes available. I think with that, thank you Forgive everyone. me, uh, Commissioner, this is Senator Bellows, and I, I hesitated to ask another question because I, I felt like I had asked so many already. Um, there was something that you shared last week, but I wanted to have you share it again, especially since you're streaming live to Facebook. Um, and, and this was part of your beginning presentation, but just to make it crystal clear for people, there's a great deal of anxiety out there um, for people who see that their um, allotted benefit amount is approaching zero and wondering what they need to do. They've heard about the state extension. They're wondering if they're going to be rolled over automatically. And I just wanted to, to have you just share out loud again for the purposes of people listening at home what, what they need to do, if anything. Because what I heard you say was it will automatically roll over and they shouldn't worry about it. It will automatically, the screen, I don't know if we can show the screen again, but let's, let's put the, what they will see. They need to continue to file their weekly certification and they will see, yep, it was, it was there and it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah. So people that are on what I'll call regular state unemployment, uh, the up to 26 weeks, if they are nearing the end of that, they get down to a zero balance, they're going to see these series of questions. Uh, once they answer those, we will automatically roll them into the PE's EUC program. Um, it takes two, two to three days to do that, but it should be done by the time the next weekly certification is filed. And the same thing if you're on the PEUC program and get down to a zero balance, you've drawn down those 13 weeks, and see the same series of questions before we move you into the extended benefit program. Right. So it's uh, again the sequence is state unemployment. You're eligible for up to 26 weeks. Then the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation program, which is 13 weeks, and then it's the state extended benefit program. But the important piece is to continue to file the weekly certifications because that's when the screen will um, show up for you. Right. And is there, um, does this apply to people that entered through self-employment or through exhausted benefits to begin with, or is it just people who are qualified for regular state unemployment? Pandemic unemployment assistance is already a 39 week program. So the self-employed are in pandemic unemployment assistance and are eligible for up to 39 weeks there. Um, for extended benefits, you would be... After the, if someone goes through the 39 weeks of the pandemic unemployment, um, they, they would not be eligible for the extended benefits. Extended benefits is a state program and you must be eligible for regular state benefits in order to be eligible for extended benefits. Okay. And if someone who's self-employed sees their balance approaching zero, are they going to continue to qualify? They would qualify for benefits so long as they have a PUA eligibility remaining. After okay. the 39 makes the PUA, there, there is not another program. Okay. But, as long, but they don't need to worry so much about that balance that's showing up on their screen. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. They, they are eligible for 39 weeks, so it's, it's not an up to, it is 39 weeks. Great, okay. 
That is all for me. Thank you. Appreciate the extension of time. You're welcome. All right. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.